So today we're going to be presenting the JavaScript version 3 chat API. And we're going to start by going over some of the high-level features of the API and what it includes. So technically, JavaScript version 3 is a new chat API that runs over our REST APIs, which means that it supports the same level of functionality that our REST client does. The difference mainly being that it's custom tailored for client-side consumption. So we optimize part of the, the way you use it and um, the way you start it in the client. So let's start. I'm going to be going over the actual documentation a bit just to get the first feel of it and explain the methods. So the API is written as an instance-based API, which means you create an instance in order to start it. And once you create that instance, we try to remember its current state. Um, the chat API has a couple of chat states that you should be listening for that are very important. First of all, there is the initialized state. The initialized state is something that shows you if you can do something. Before you have an initialized state, the API is absolutely useless. You can't make any calls to it. I'm going to show briefly afterwards how you listen to states. Resume state is something that happens if you refresh the page and you have the API and you create an instance with the same parameters again. It tries to resume the previous session. You should listen to that and not try to start a new chat when resuming. We also block for that. If you're in your resuming state and we see that there's a chat going on, we're not going to let you start another chat in order to prevent splitting sessions. Uninitialized state is something that um, might happen in case we can't initialize the API and you can't use it. So if that happens, it should mark an error for you. And then there are the very general states that always existed in most of our chat APIs, which is waiting while you're waiting for an operator to respond, chatting where you're in a chat, and ended when the chat has finished. There is also a new state in the API, which is a not found state, which means that if you refresh the page, and the chat has already been dumped in our memory. We can't resume all the information of the state. And you should, should be aware that if you had any chat lines and any events that you showed before, we can't bring them back for you. One of the new things of the API is that it supports surveys now. You can get the pre-chat survey, the offline survey, and the exit survey via the API. I'm not going to delve into surveys too much here because there's a whole document that explains surveys and how to use them in the API, including um, a small library that helps you manage the survey logic, since we have some logic in the surveys if you define it in the admin area. So that's surveys. First thing you do is create an instance. As I said, it's instance-based, so I define a variable here. And then this is the namespace of the API on the page, and you create a new instance things that you have to pass in are the app key and the live person number, which is the site you're going to be using. The, when you create the instance, you can also automatically request to bind to certain events. Um, all the events you can bind, you can bind here already. These are the recommended events to bind to. We'll go over them just in a bit in order to delve deeper. Um, there's a kind of change in functionality here because people are used to having a config on the page that we read and we bind according to it, we no longer read configs on the page, which means that if you want to bind to something the minute that it starts, you have to pass in your functions. There is an option to pass the domain in here as well, if you know it already. But if you don't, we'll take care of that for you, so you don't have to pass in the domain. The binding of the API supports three different functions on the onStart method. It supports getting a function, you can pass in an anonymous, anonymous function or a, or a pointer, an object, which allows you to pass a pointer to the function and the context for the execution of that function, or an array that contains functions and objects, so you can mix them. Now the API technically has two different type of operating modes, they're all exposed as functions obviously, but some of them are callback functions, and we'll go back to that a bit later. And some of them are direct functions. So once you have an initialized API, you can request the estimated wait time 
we're getting a specific agent of a specific skill or a service queue. And everything here works asynchronously. When you make the request, we actually push a request to the server, get back the response, and then we either publish it or, in this API, we provide a way to provide direct methods, which means that if you have a method um, that makes a request now and wants to get the response in that same object, you can pass in the method for the success and the error. It's important to note that the success and error methods are always run after we publish the events. So if you bind it to events, they will trigger before the success and error methods. This goes the same for available slots. We're available by skill, max wait time, or agent. And again, same type of functionality. Success method, error method, or you could be binding to the callback. Same thing for get availability. If you want to understand um, what, what availability you have for a specific skill, for a specific service queue. There are some limitations here that if you want to listen to a specific service queue, you have to define what the max wait time that's acceptable for your chat is. Get pre-chat survey. Again, the methodology is very similar in all of these. Um, you can pass in for a specific visitor profile, if you know the visitor profile name, for a skill, a visitor IP, and then have the system define for you what the response is, or a specific survey name, if you know the survey name. There is more on surveys, as I said, in the survey helper. This is a sample of what the response is. I don't know what the exact outcome is in JS2. What we did in this API is we only give you the object that you really need. If there's like um, response headers, or a metadata that doesn't interest you because you're not going to consume it, then we mask that for you. You don't need it. You just get back the actual survey. So this is a survey response. You get, you get the survey, and the pointer and size tells you what the ID is, what the questions are, what the header is. It really gives you the, the data you need in order to operate. And that's the, that's the assumption throughout the whole API. You get the data that you need in order to perform an action, in order to be, um, decide something important about the next phase. It never gives you back data that's useless. That's, we try to optimize for that, at least. An important thing to note in requesting a chat is that if you requested a pre-chat survey, this is where you pass it in, is the response. The actual survey data for, for what, the, what your customer filled in should be passed in here. OK, and here's a sample of what it looks like. Again, we have the helper. If we have time, we'll go over that as well a bit. So requesting a chat, again, it supports all the basic functionality that we've always had. You can route to a specific agent. You can request a specific skill. And service queue and max wait time are always linked together. If you don't pass in a refer, we'll take care of that for you. And you can pass in a set of custom variables if you want to set them when you start the chat. You can also pass pre-chat lines in the form of an array of strings. Pre-chat lines, it's an old feature um, that says you can send now five or six or how many lines you want before the chat started that you want the operator to be aware of. And the operator will get them. It's for the operator, not the visitor. So basically, so, so use case can be uh, the virtual agents. This is the conversation I've had so far from the visitor, for example. Yeah, this is supported on the REST API for a long time now. OK, if you notice, there's one thing I didn't go over, which is important to, to understand. Every request and every function that you call returns something. Now, if that something is undefined, then you can go ahead and ignore it. But if there's an error, um, this is shown better up here. If you get back something and it contains an error, that means that your request did not even go through. It was stopped at the validation stage before we even sent it to the server. So it's important to always capture the responses of the API. Now, technically, once you actually write an API and, and you write um, a chat using the API and you test it a couple of times, this is probably not something that you'll need. But we still, we still always return something in order for you to understand if there's an error. 
Is there a limit of characters? Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's like the limit that we have for Senate. I think it's something like 5,000 or 6,000 characters. What happens here is we, we abstract splitting of requests for you. So if your request is very large, we'll handle the splitting on the server side for you. So, so there's no limit? There's not supposed to be, not, not really a hard limit. There is a limit, but it's a limit you're not supposed to reach. I mean, you're not supposed to be sending like a whole web page as part of your request. Okay. okay. So when you request a chat, what happens is you'll get back a very complicated object. You don't necessarily have to deal with that object. Uh, since the information is always going to be broken down for you as a response as well. This object contains a lot of information. Um, it contains information about the visitor itself, it contains information about the agent, uh, it contains chat lines, it contains absolutely everything that happens when you request a chat. The response to what kind of response? Chat request. Okay. Now the same response will also come back to you as broken down pieces. There's um, state responses, and there's start responses, and there's info responses. We'll get to that shortly, which are a better way of handling this information. Adding a line is as simple as it was before. You just pass in the text itself as a parameter on the object you pass in. And again, you can pass success and error methods. Now, success and error, it's important to note, they only tell you if the server has received the line. This is not a red notification for the agent. This doesn't mean the agent has read the message, but that the server has accepted the message and put it in the queue for the agent. And the response is an echo. We echo what you sent. Setting visitor typing is a Boolean. Again, typing true, false, same sort of thing. Setting the visitor name is also possible. Right. That's the visitor, the visitor typing, not the agent typing? You can't set agent typing. This is set Did not. Yeah, yeah, you can. Okay. I'll show how. You can set the visitor name. It's important to note that if the visitor name has not changed or the typing status has not changed, there will be no request sent. Okay, we look at what you're sending and we say, wait, is that the current state? Is that the current name? And if so, we ignore the request. And chat works the same way. And again, you can listen to the success and error here. And we will also trigger it. This is the state event that signifies that the chat has ended. Setting custom variables is also available from the API. We tried to simplify it as much as possible, which means you pass a custom variable object, and then it's key value. So you can pass in as many as you want in here. Your question is, pass the skill on what? On a, cast, on a custom variable? Yeah, I mean set the skill. That's hacky yes. behavior. That's very hacky behavior to do that. There's a lot of use cases where we have to have that. It's very but you can set it on the chat request. There's no need to pass it in here. You can set the skill when you request the chat. Why would you have to set it on custom variable? When you, when you actually send the chat request, okay, you can set the skill. There's no need to pass it in as a custom variable. I think the most use case is sometimes based on the survey answers, the skill is being set, and then we will change that. I'll, I'll, I just don't know what you said. I'll, 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 based on the survey answer, if you have a pre-chat that includes skill? Yeah. Yeah, you, you also know yeah, the survey. You know the survey answer before you start the chat. You can include you're, passing, you're passing the survey answer in here. No. Okay, so this is the answer to the pre-chat. If it has a skill and you want to override it, it's better to write, override it here or pass it as a skill parameter. I don't know which one of these takes precedence. We'll have to check. So we went over adding a line, setting typing states, ending a chat, setting custom variables, requesting a transcript. <coughs> Again, very simple. Success and error as always, so you can notify the visitor immediately what the state is for that request. And you just pass in the email. It has to be a valid email. If it's not valid, you'll get back the failed request response here. You'll get an error. Yeah, what happens automatically also, I don't know if you've seen this, but when you send that and it succeeds, what will happen is there will be an info line automatically triggered for the visitor that says this will be sent to you at the end of the chat, to this email. You can do this as long as the session is live. And 
not live after you end. Chat. When you end the chat, if you requested a pre on exit survey and an exit survey returned, we keep the session alive at longer polling intervals until you submit the survey. If there is no exit survey though, then when you end the chat, the chat ends, and then it's it's a, a matter of about two minutes or one minute before it gets dumped. There are other variables in the system that change that a bit, but you should always assume that if you ended a chat and there's no exit survey, you have about one to two minutes to perform any further actions on the chat, including requesting transcript. There's all there's all a question like that in the exit survey that you can configure. Exit survey again works the same way as the previous surveys. You just request exit survey and you can have your own callback functions or you can listen to on exit survey. We're getting to events soon, so that'll be clear. Submitting the exit survey has its own method. It expects survey. It is not the, the API does not validate your format for the survey. So if your format is wrong, you'll get back an answer that says you weren't able to submit the survey. Getting the offline survey is something that you can do, again, according to different parameters. You can request it against skill, visitor profile, a visitor ID, or a specific survey name. Submitting the offline survey, again, very much the same as submitting all of the other surveys except the pre-chat. You pass it in as a parameter, and that's the survey. Now, these methods marked with um, a red asterisk are methods that are synchronous. What do I mean? I mean that according to what I have in terms of information currently on the chat, you'll get an immediate response. So if you ask for state, according to the last state event I got in the chat, you'll get that immediately. There's no asynchronous callback. You'll notice that there is no way to pass in success or error methods for any of these. It'll just return the states according to the states above that we've already shown. Agent name, visitor name, agent ID, session ID, session key, and the typing status for the agent. Any questions on these? No. Yeah, if you want to know it at a specific state and you don't want to wait for the event, you can always request it immediately. There is no real need to do that because every time there's a change, you'll get a trigger that there's a change and here's the change. And let's go over the triggers because they're, they're a very big part of how you actually use this API in a friendly way. 